Okay, let's start in, and we should have the midterms graded and recorded by Wednesday. Uh, we'll get them back to you in section or um, right before or after lecture on Wednesday. Next one, I mean, so not this Wednesday, but next week, because we're still grading the essays, right, and stuff like that. Um, it looks so far like scores on the essays that I've seen graded are pretty good, and uh, I think people kind of learned how to do the uh, multitasking necessary for multiple choice fill and compare and essay writing in this class. And so here's the game plan. We've got four more weeks, then our, our, our week, and then final exam. Today we're going to talk about the difficult topic of suicidal behavior and self-injury, and go in Wednesday to talk about stigma, and then next Monday, a week from today, talk about issues of communication about mental illness and families. I'll talk a lot about my own family with some fairly personal disclosures about how I got into the field. If there's a lecture you might want to make in person, those of you listening in on webcast, next Monday would probably be a good one uh, for a much more personal account of mental illness. And then we've got a few more topics, intellectual disability, eating disorders, prevention, uh, to take us through the end of the course. Remember on the final, most of the final is midterm three. So it'll be just like midterms one and two, non-cumulative. Then there'll be either two semi-short or one long essay at the end of midterm three that will take into account some of the principles from the first part of the course, choice of disorders from the second part of the course, and the material from the third part that's more integrative. But you won't need to, for that, have a level of detail that you needed to study for midterms one and two. So we'll explain that more. Yeah. No, there'll be an essay. So midterm three will be just like midterms one and two on this material. Then there'll be a broad, cumulative short essay pair or essay that won't require the level of detail, but you'll have to know something about principles and some choice of disorders that we've talked about. Make sense? So today, we've got to start with terminology, because there's a lot of terms used to describe this difficult topic we're going to talk about. So we'll get to the top point in a second. If your intention if things are so hopeless that you are really intending to take your own life, we could say you've got that as a pretty specific idea, not just sort of a general, life sucks today, but I really don't feel my life is worth living. You might have that idea and have a plan. You might actually make an attempt, either through a very lethal method like a gun, or through a less lethal, but nonetheless lethal method like swallowing pills, and you might complete the suicide. You might actually die. So those three things assume that you had a specific intention to end your life. But what about a range of behaviors that are pretty destructive, that aren't, if we asked you, you'd say, I wasn't intending to kill myself, but I feel some terrible pain inside, and I'm going to burn myself or cut myself or mutilate myself somehow. <coughs> to express that pain. So what are the terms? Sometimes that's called para-suicide. Sometimes it's called deliberate self-harm, or it can be the more specific terms, self-mutilation, cutting, burning. The more general term is NSSI, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. And we're going to talk about this throughout the, the next part of the hour. It assumes that you did not intend to kill yourself, but nonetheless you're doing some pretty destructive things to your body. If you go to the bottom, self-inflicted injury, that could include a suicide attempt, or it could include a non-suicidal form of self-injurious behavior. So you know, we're not going to do a specific question on what's the splitting hairs difference, but it's good to know what the range of terms is because these things blend into one another. And as we said at the very top here, these are difficult topics to talk about. Albert Camus, the French philosopher, once said in a late 40s philosophical essay, the only important philosophical question in the 20th century, and maybe of all time, is should you kill yourself? Is life really worth living? So this is philosophical as well as psychological. Somebody has a hand up question so far on terms? All right, so let's go ahead. Let's talk about suicide. This is intentional. You want to end your life. I think everybody knows this. There's a lot of PR on campus and on many social media. Among people in the United States, 25 and under, this is the third leading cause of death. Or the first two, accidental injury and homicide. If you're a college student, college campuses are relatively protected. Homicide dips down, so suicide is the second leading cause of death among all college students in the United States. What about, remember, so there's ideation. You really feel that you don't want to live anymore. You make an attempt. Attempts are higher in females around the world. Completed suicides, the rate's higher in men. Why overall? Because men tend to use more lethal means like guns. But this is changing. There's recent data from China where the suicide completion rate is rising among women because women are not just swallowing poisons or pills, but have access to firearms and are using these lethal means to end their lives. So the sort of general rule is, remember, women tend to get major depression at least twice as much as men. So it's somewhat not surprising that they would attempt suicide more than men. Men complete at a higher rate, usually because of access to guns and very lethal means, but that might be culturally relative and maybe changing before our eyes. What about substance abuse? One of the risk factors for suicide is being intoxicated, loaded, high. Because among other things, what do substances do to your brain? They cloud your judgment and they make you do things more impulsively than you would before. So we talk about depression, we talk about bipolar disorder, other risk factors for suicide. Substance abuse has to be part of the mix. Hopelessness, so people have many depression scales to rate how depressed a person is on a dimensional way of looking at it. But there's other more specific scales about how hopeless do you feel? Can anything you do make a difference in your life or the world? And people who are, again, not surprisingly, very high on hopelessness have a strong urge to end their lives. What about impulsivity? We all go through most weeks, most months, most years feeling pretty upset about stuff. Life is stressful, but you usually tide it over thinking that things will get better unless you're really impulsive and you can't stand that difficult emotion for a few seconds. We talked about bipolar disorder having such a high rate of suicide. Part of the reason is when you get into a manic state or a mixed state, you're very impulsive. It's hard to imagine staying with that horrible feeling for very long. And if you have access to pills or a weapon, suicide may be a quick option, a quick way of really regulating those negative emotions. If you look at the world's literature on people who have made a serious suicide attempt and survived, what will most people tell you? If I could have just got through that difficult period. I didn't know that it would look better. I felt trapped in, hemmed in, hopeless. One of the goals of suicide prevention is, is to get people out of that impulsive, I've got to regulate this emotion at any cost way of being, to get to a point where there might be a solution. So impulsivity and hopelessness are a big part of this. If we were talking more politically, what about rational suicide? What if I've got a chronic illness? What if I've got a form of cancer that's up to stage three and four, and I want to end my life before cancer ravages my body? Well, that's suicide, but is that rational suicide? It's not the result of a mental illness, it's the result of my choosing to end my life. Should that be legal? Is that ethical? Should doctors assist with that? But how do you know that that so-called rational suicide wasn't tinged with depression? We all know people who had stage four cancer and survived, sometimes for many years. It's a fine line between my rationally, unemotionally saying I want to end my life versus that being tinged with hopelessness, impulsivity, and depression. 
if you look at the data, the suicide rate's going up in the United States and in much of the world today. One person, let's see, we started the lecture about 11 after. So by the time the lecture ends, three or four people will now be dead in the United States from a completed suicide. It's about one every 15 minutes. It's a high rate. It's higher than traffic fatalities now because of seat belts and airbags and all that kind of stuff. And speed limits, not 90 miles an hour, but 55 or 65. Suicide's a very emotional topic. You read in the paper, you know of a family friend who's committed suicide. They've got a family. And you probably think, I know, I think, how could that person have been so selfish? What are they thinking about? Don't they know what's devastating their kids, their siblings, their parents? How could you do that? How cruel. You're not even feeling uh, remotely empathic. All you're concerned about is your own cares and worries. It's easy to forget that when people are really seriously depressed and often agitated depressions like in bipolar disorder and really feel despairing and hopeless, what do they think? I'm a burden. I know how everybody's suffering, taking care of me, or trying to give sympathy, and I'm depressed, and I'm sort of beyond receiving any help. Everybody would be better off if I weren't around. I'm doing people a favor. And this isn't just a rationalization. Many people who get to that point of suicidal despair actually feel that everybody would be better off without him or her around. So in some ways, even though it seems distorted, it's an act of mercy. It's a highly empathic act for people to attempt to complete suicide because now no one will have to worry about them. And of course, that's some tunnel vision. People aren't aware of what the devastation is of having a family member and that legacy having committed suicide. But I think it's important to remember that perspective. What do sociologists rather than psychologists say about suicide? Durkheim, one of the fathers of sociology back 150 years ago, talked about anomie, the French term for aimlessness, normlessness. If you don't have a purpose in the wider society, why would life be worth living? So it's kind of interesting that rather than inner psychological, sociologists tend to think about social bonds and connectedness. connectedness and if you don't have that, suicide might well be an option. What does our psychiatric perspective say? Obviously, depression has a high suicide rate. Depression is associated with hopelessness. Bipolar disorder, probably the highest of all, because now you get mania, impulsivity, very difficult problems in, in regulating emotions. People with borderline personality disorders, which we'll talk about a little bit later. People with severe obsessive compulsive disorder who are plagued by the fears of contamination or the fears of imperfection and are engaging in compulsions hours and hours a day. Surprisingly high suicide rate among people with severe OCD. Life gets really intolerable. Eating disorders, anorexia nervosa. You're restricting, you're exercising, you're restricting your diet. Bulimia, you're making yourself throw up, your electrolytes are imbalanced. Are you trying to kill yourself? Is that an intentional suicide? Many people die from eating disorders. And it's hard again to draw the line between was that an intentional or was it a subintentional act of suicide? What about legally? Suicide is still against the law in many jurisdictions. It's certainly immoral. Talk about the moral model back from lecture number two. It's a mortal sin. It's a mortal sin of ending your own life. It's truly moral. There's high stigma. If you have had a family member or somebody close to you commit suicide, it's hard to talk about. That person really had weak personal character. They couldn't even face the stresses of life. So suicide and self-destructive behavior rings out across sociology, psychology, psychiatry, legal, religious, all kinds of strictures. So we talked about this a little bit in discussing the triple bind, focusing on young people, people under 25. Suicide rate went up pretty regularly, slowly and steadily, after World War II to the late 80s. 1988, remember, the year Prozac was legalized for sale in the United States. The suicide rate among young people went down for 15 years, maybe because of better prevention, maybe because of access to SSRI medications. It's gone up in the last decade among young people, especially for whom? Girls, young women. So we talked about the triple bind as maybe one explanation for that. Starting back in the 30s and 40s, preventive psychology in many ways got to start with something called suicide hotlines. Some of you volunteer for these. You get pretty intensive training. You learn to listen. You try to talk a person through, hear them out, getting them that bridge of a few extra hours, days to get to a place of greater hope. Some of you know of, or even members of, our campus chapter of Active Minds. <coughs> Active Minds started 11 years ago when my colleague Allison Nauman, young woman in Washington, D.C., lost her brother to suicide. He was a college student. So starting very slowly, and now with about 375 chapters around the country, Active Minds is a college self-help support discussion group about suicide, depression, mental health in general. And the fact that it's gone from zero Active Minds chapters to about 375 in 10 years shows how much students want to talk about this stuff in themselves, roommates, friends, family. Depression and suicide are big issues. So now we're going to shift to the person who is not intending to end his or her life, but is exhibiting some really distressing destructive behaviors, NSSI, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. It's a self-inflicted injury, but you don't have the intent. If you really had that clear intent, if we could know that from suicide, you don't have the intent to end your life. So what are self-destructive behaviors? We won't ask for a show of hands. How many of you pick your cuticles? A lot of people do. It bleeds a little bit. That's the, maybe the mildest form. All the way to relatively few of us burn our skin with cigarettes or gouge our heads against a radiator until there's bumps and bleeding or the one that's the stereotypic most common, take a very sharp instrument, a knife, a razor, and make marks into your skin and watch the blood ooze. So those are the classic forms of suicidal, I'm sorry, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, NSSI. Here's the problem with saying, over here are people who want to end their lives, and over there are people who are engaging in NSSI. Number one, if you look at people who've made a serious suicide attempt, what's one of the big risk factors for that? Engaging in a pattern of NSSI behaviors. So it may be that after a period of months or years of cutting or burning or self-mutilating, things are getting worse, and you actually make a suicide attempt. And that line is hard to draw. Second, what if your intention is not to kill yourself, but the gouge you make or the cutting you do in your skin leads to major blood loss, and you do die. That happens. So even though your intent may not be to die, you may end up in the emergency room and end up as a mortality. So again, it's not 100% crystal clear that there's an absolute distinction. Question. Because this is what psychologists do. You try to put things in test. That's what the DSM does, right? So we can distinguish. Maybe there's a different set of risk factors for cutting behavior that are different from the risk factors for really trying to end your life. But as I'm saying, there's some evidence that that's the case, but the distinction gets blurry pretty quickly. Question. Who gets to decide, well, that's the problem, isn't it? You can only know by asking the person what their intent was. But what if a person was really loaded or high? Maybe they're not sure what their intent was. Or maybe a person who's been chronically depressed for a long time now has a manic episode on top of it, says, my life hasn't been worth living for 10 years. I finally had the energy with the mania to do it. 
So is that a reliable judgment? What about a suicide note? A lot of people don't leave notes, but a lot of people do. And is a suicide note the accurate reflection of your intent, or is it trying to assuage guilt or uh, make family members feel better? This is one of the problems. It's not very reliable often to get this information. You can only get it from the person himself or herself as to what their intent is. That's how you make the decision. Other questions about this? Let's see. Right, so the last point again. A big risk factor for suicide attempts is a history of NSSI, and a supposedly non-suicidal self-injurious behavior might lead to a suicide if the wound is, is deep enough or severe enough. So what are the theories about why somebody would engage in an SSI behavior? Well, the two main ones are, one is psychological and the other is more social. So on the psychological side, maybe because of a history of maltreatment, or maybe because you're experiencing a depression, or maybe because you are friendless, or maybe dot, dot, dot. You've got a feeling inside that you can't really express in words, but it's a pretty awful feeling. It's harsh, negative emotion. And if you've got that negative emotion, but there's nobody to talk with about it, or you don't have the words to do it, maybe a way to soothe yourself in a kind of paradoxical, awful way, or a way of feeling that pain or expressing it physically, is to watch yourself bleed, or to feel the pain of the knife going into your skin, or the burn mark going into another part of your body. So at least now, it's not just in your head. There's physical pain to kind of instantiate or exemplify the pain you're feeling deep inside. There's a funny Greek term, alexithymia, that you see in the psychiatric journals a lot these days. It's a Greek term meaning feelings that can't be expressed in words. And it's kind of a metaphor. If for any one of a number of risk factors, you're feeling terrible, these negative emotions can't really be controlled, and again, there's nobody to talk with about it, maybe a substitute, a way of making the pain visible is to engage in these self-destructive behaviors. There's often shame. How many teenage girls in high schools do we see, and girls have a higher prevalence than boys, in long sleeve baggy sweatshirts hiding the scar marks on their arms? This is something that's often very private. Now, we just talked about OCD before the last midterm. One theory, and this isn't, doesn't apply to all cases, is you've got this deep feeling of terrible pain, discomfort, distress. That's like an obsession, isn't it? And what's the compulsive behavior to kind of get rid of that pain? That might be the act of cutting or burning yourself. And what do we know about OCD behaviors? The compulsion temporarily assuages the pain, but then the pain comes back or the obsession comes back deeper the next time. So at least in some individuals, a psychological mechanism may be a kind of obsessive compulsive escalating cycle of self-injurious behavior. So those are the sort of psychological inner focus. But we also know that NSSI is rising fast. How fast? It's hard to tell because there wasn't a term for this 35 years ago. You can go back in Psych Info or Midline and look back into the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 60s and 70s, there's no psychological studies or psychiatric studies because no one had invented a term yet. So is it that part of the rate of increase is, oh, I'm a girl at a public high school, and I know that my friend engaged in this behavior. I'm not feeling so good about myself, too. Maybe I, it's like contagion, copycat. Is there a kind of social function, or at least a social mimicry or modeling involved? In some cases, yes, but most of the evidence would show that these psychological factors are probably more important, but there is some copying and contagion. Depending on how you feel about the web, and about disclosure, and about treatment, you can go to, pretty quickly, don't do it now during lecture, but afterwards, you can go to a lot of cutting websites, under non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, under self-mutilation, or under whatever. And what you can do in some of these is find somebody around your age or with your level of distress to share. Maybe this is the first time you've ever opened up about these feelings you have and some of the behaviors you've committed. Great source of support. You don't have to go to a therapist. It's free. Maybe you can get support. But what's the problem, on the other hand, with these websites? It's a how to do it manual for how to burn deeper or cut deeper. Just like some years ago, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, there used to be the pro Anna websites, pro anorexia. No freaking doctor or parent's going to tell me how I look. I'm hot by getting thinner and thinner. The more emaciated I am, the better I look. And I'm never getting treatment. It's a personal choice. So these pro anorexia websites, a lot of them are closed down now, are really anti treatment. So are websites for cutting and self-injurious behavior sort of the saving grace to get people the support they need, or are they like the how to do it manual for even more harsher ways of destroying yourself? Huge question. Now, in the DSM, we've talked about depression and bipolar disorder and cognitive disorder and ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. There's another category of disorders that are called Axis II, and DSM-5 has changed it somewhat. It's a long story. But the idea is you could have depression, you could have ADHD, but you could have another way of being in the world that's really deep-seated personality traits. You've always got these traits, and if they're really maladaptive and really persistent, you might have what we call an Axis II disorder as opposed to Axis I, the depression and ADHD, et cetera. The idea is that from our temperament and then the personality traits that develop, we might all form certain ways of being in the world. I mean, it's kind of hard to change. Some of you are really compulsive studiers. Some of you study the day before the midterm and do well. Some are partiers, some are not. But what if you had a configuration of personality traits where you were so perfectionistic all the time, you got no pleasure? That would be so called something called obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's not OCD, but it's a long standing set of personality traits. What if you have a set of personality traits? that look a lot like Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction. You thrive on stormy relationships. You idealize people, but then if they reject you, you want to destroy them. You're highly impulsive. 